Hey folks, David Stewart here. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I want to talk a little bit about Brian Johnson, not the singer from ACDC, though he's fun to talk about too, but the tech millionaire who has gained a lot of attention, not for selling Venmo, which I think was how he made his money, but in developing this very expensive anti-aging protocol, which he then uh, tries to share with people and he sells supplements that are related to it that he calls the Blueprint Protocol. I want to talk about him a little bit, partly because he's you know, continually getting attention. So uh, it's a way for me to parasitize it, but really because there's some deeper things that I want to talk about and point people to with Brian Johnson. Uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about the Blueprint Protocol and some of the things he says, but other content creators who are, you know, fitness experts or nutrition experts have dealt with the the supplement stack and have dealt with um, some of his anti-aging interventions and some of the things he's doing. Um, so you can watch them if you want a deeper insight into that. What I want to talk about is the religious ethos that motivates Brian, what is underneath everything he's doing, because when you listen to him for an extended period of time or really just any length of time, you very quickly realize that he's motivated by a religious sentiment, though he may not express it himself. And that's sort of the main thrust of what I'm going to talk about. But before I talk about that, I do want to talk about some of the practical things with the Blueprint Protocol. Uh, Brian gives out lots of advice that I think is good. I don't dislike Brian Johnson and I like his content. And in general, I think he gives good advice for health. Uh, I'm not a doctor, so don't take that to the bank, but it's pretty orthodox, actually. Most of it is is fairly orthodox, even though he says it's very science-based. There are like saints and philosophers that have talked about um, living according to what he calls his five power laws. There's actually six. He always adds a sixth one in there, which is sleep. If I can remember those off the top of my head, it's it's no alcohol or little to no alcohol. Don't smoke, right? Um, low BMI, I think 20 to like 24 BMI, maybe a narrower range, but you know, low body fat, right? A uh, good diet, and that would be a blueprint like diet that can mean a lot of things. And then um, it would be exercise, like five to seven weeks of exercise. He adds a six one, which is sleep, get lots of sleep. Sleep is where your body's going to repair itself. This is very orthodox advice. It's very classical. If you were to ask almost any kind of fitness expert, like how could somebody, like what are the biggest things somebody can do to increase their health, increase their lifespan? It would probably be a list, something like that. Don't smoke. Uh, in fact, I, if I remember correctly, most of the gains of average lifespan in the 20th century were because people stopped smoking. And before that, most of the average gains were because of sanitation, which really lets you know how important it is to prevent disease versus just curing disease. It's a lot easier to never get lung cancer than to uh, try to cure lung cancer. Having known several people who've had lung cancer, it is a pretty brutal disease. So avoiding it, which smoking is going to give you a good opportunity to have it, and avoiding smoking is going to reduce your ability to get it. It's going to reduce your chances of getting it. So that's probably a good thing to pick up. So those are his power laws. I think they're generally good. If you're looking at like the blueprint stack, which is this expensive supplement stack he sells, I actually don't think it's unreasonably priced for the amount of supplements that are in it. If you were to get those from other companies, you'd probably end up be paying the same amount. Last I checked for his, it was like $400 a month or something, right? Which is expensive, but it has a lot of stuff. And most of the stuff that that's in it is like food derived, right? It's like there's an olive oil and there's like a protein powder and there's like a bunch of stuff that includes like garlic and things like that. These things aren't necessarily going to harm you, right? And a lot of those things you would get in food normally, but I could see if you had a really restricted diet that that, you know, that supplement stack could be useful to make sure, for instance, that you're getting garlic every single day because I don't need a ton of things with garlic. Maybe garlic supplementation would be would be useful. When I look at the supplement stack, uh, my tendency, by the way, would be like, well, if I was gonna do that, I would just like add it to what I already do because part of that goes with, if you look at the whole protocol, which uh, maybe I'll link it down below, I'll link my, my Substack article that has a lot of that stuff in it. Uh, there's, you know, meals, the meals he eats, he eats like mostly a vegan diet. Uh, when I look at his meals, I'm like, I'm not encouraged to want to do the blueprint uh, the blueprint protocol. And so if it was like, Hey, if you eat this disgusting slop food <laughs> every day, you're going to live an extra, how much, how much extra am I going to live? Is it going to be worth it to me? Well, I, I know that I probably wouldn't be able to, to 
have the discipline to eat that. I break down after a while because it's too disgusting. I've done it before. And like I lost a huge amount of weight like 10 years ago or something. Actually, a little longer than that, like 12 years ago. And I kind of figured out very quickly that eating quinoa and ultra health food just made me go to the taco store and eat 30 tacos. I just didn't have the discipline with all the other things that are going in my life to do that. So it, I spent a lot of time finding food that was low calorie that I could stand to eat for a long period of time. And that was what ended up producing a huge amount of weight loss. Um, so yeah, when I look at that food, I'm like, I, I don't want to do it. Maybe you could though, right? And maybe looking at the food would inspire you to think about what kind of diet you're eating and what kind of things you include. So most of what Brian's doing in a practical level, I don't really have a problem with. He gets a lot of attention for like, he has a red light therapy and he has this you know, stem cell therapies and things like that. But the, as far as the main stuff he sells with his like nutrition company, I think that's what he actually eats. And it's not like horribly overpriced, like with most celebrity, um, you know, supplement stacks that you see out there. So, you know, take it or leave it. That's what it is. I don't have like a, a too negative opinion of it. Um, if I'm going to make another sort of practical criticism of Brian Johnson stuff, which is that um, he is advocating abdicating responsibility for his life. That's his whole point. It's like, I designed an algorithm that could make better decisions than I could. And he has a great anecdote about like evening Brian, right? It's like inside of you are different people with different wills. Like, in other words, your desires change throughout the day and depending on context. Um, and so evening Brian would make bad decisions, like make him eat candy or whatever at night. So evening Brian no longer gets to make those decisions because he makes bad decisions. So instead, we're giving our decision making over to a robot, which is going to make better decisions for us. And the robot is going to design its decisions based on science. And here's where we're actually going to get into the deep level of what I think is going on with Brian, which is that he has a religious motivation for what he's doing. His religion is now scientism, what I call scientism, what lots of other people have called scientism. His former religion was Mormonism. He was a Mormon. And so this is very common with people who apostatize to their religion and uh, from their religion and become agnostic or atheist as they replace one religion with another. Very often, it's just the cult of the state. In this case, it's the cult of science. Science can mean lots of things. In this case, what I think science means to Brian is the you know the collective knowledge of published peer reviewed research papers that's what science is right so there's this research thing we publish papers about it they find certain things and then we're going to make decisions based on those findings some of you who have followed me for a while know that the, there's problems with that namely that 50% of all published research is false. <laughs> so you're giving your decision-making power over to, over to something that if it doesn't have the ability to discern between what is true and false as far as the studies, then that's going to be a problem. The other thing is that, um, and other people have mentioned this, interventions which help very ill people don't necessarily help healthy people. So if you're taking... You know, it's like the statin drug problem that um, Nassim Taleb talks about is that statin drugs are helpful for people who've already had heart attacks and are really sick, but they harm people who aren't sick. There's no evidence that they help people who are sick. So it's applying to the edges of the distribution benefits that you think will help the, the center of the distribution. And that's just not the case. Now, as far as the power laws go, yeah, they might reduce your early death but they aren't going to increase maximum lifespan. And that's what he's actually questing for. He has this motto that is don't die. Okay, well, I'm gonna break some eggs here and I'm gonna just tear that veil off. You will die, we will all die. None of us is escaping death. Okay, uh, interventions that increase average lifespan for a pop at the population level are not going to eliminate death. They're not going to increase maximum lifespan either, right? There's people who live to be 100, 110. Like we hear about people that um, live to some really extreme ages. We're not breaking that barrier, right? We're not getting to 130. I just don't believe it's going to happen. Believing that science is going to solve the problem of aging is scientism. So what is scientism as a religious belief? It is believing in science as a god, that there's this egregoric entity called science that 
uh, that bequeaths upon us knowledge which will benefit us. And uh, in this case, uh, Brian's also a transhumanist. It believes that somehow it will unlock immortality. Now, there's no reason to believe that science would unlock immortality because it never has. Uh, so that would be an unforeseen event. So expecting a black swan is different from knowing that black swans happen, right? Uh, so there's no reason to believe that we're going to just suddenly figure out how to not, not die anymore. We might be able to extend average lifespan. We might be able to be healthier into our old, old age. And all those things are good. And indeed, some of the things that he's promoting might someday be proven to do that, to, to make you healthier when you're older, right? So uh, living to 100, that could suck if you're really unhealthy. It could be more tolerable if you're healthy and your brain's working and your body's able to work. Um, so the healthier you are in your old age, the more old age is maybe a benefit, the more you're going to enjoy old age. But uh, living in a, in a torturous ruin of a cybernetic body is not going to be most people's idea of beneficial extra life. Um, but I think, you know, if we can increase health towards the end of life and make life better, that could be good. It could be good. Now, the problem with that as well, and I'm going to get religious here, is that uh, it's the problem of sin, is that eternal life in a fallen state is hell. That's the experience of hell. So until we solve the problem of sin, very long life or eternal life is actually not a benefit, right? It's a curse. So you have to solve the moral problem. Are you going to solve the moral problem? Well, we've had a long time for people to try to solve the moral problem and we've never done it. So there's no reason to believe that science is going to solve the, the moral problem more than philosophers ever have, more than anyone else ever has. Okay, so we're not getting rid of sin. Uh, so even if you were to try to unlock immortality, like by downloading someone's personality into a computer, that would be a pretty hellish existence. And um, that would be to inflict hell upon people. So Brian's scientism, if we want a, an example of scientism, it's a belief that like science, science does better solutions than nature, right? Nature gives us this life. It gives us this body. Right, God gives us this life, this body, and we're natural beings, we're animals, and we're limited by the the way the world works. There's no animals that are immortal, so we'll die just like everything else dies, right? There's no life that's immortal, it reproduces, and that's the form of immortality is passing on its genes and its natures to the next generation of things. That's how life persists. So life persists, but individual life doesn't persist, and there's no escaping that. Uh, an example of scientism would be, say, uh, like baby formula, believing that baby formula is better for uh, babies because science designed it. It was designed by scientists. Now, this was a real belief that people had in the 1950s. Uh, my grandma or uh, my grandma bottle fed at least her first few kids because doctors told her that breast milk was better. It had been designed by uh, scientists. So it was better for the kids. It had been designed to meet their nutritional needs, whereas breast milk was gross and weird and came out of the human body. And uh, now we've wisened up to that fact, but that doesn't mean that we're free from this sentiment of scientism, that people aren't going to make the same mistake with what science says now. So like, can we design better nutrition for people now? Uh, maybe, uh, but uh, do you want to fall into the trap of thinking that just because someone who has the label scientist uh, decrees that you should do something that that is going to be better than what uh, nature delivers, right? So our natural bodies, our natural lifespans, um, are you really going to be able to overcome that? And doing those interventions, doing those things differently from how nature kind of intended us to grow up, get into our prime, start to decay, and then eventually die, that you're going to create a superior situation of that. I think that is a certain hubris that's attached to scientism. And it's a faith-based position, right? Where you have faith that somehow science is going to solve this problem. And Brian's putting his money where his mouth is. He's investing in all kinds of technology. He's another guy who touts AI. He's like, we need to merge with AI. We need to use AI, right? The last few years of AI hype should should tell you everything that you need to know about um, about AI. The truth is that line does not always go up, right? We've talked about this flawed thinking before that just because something is growing at one point doesn't mean it's going to grow forever, right? That's never we've never really observed that. And while AI might continue to grow, 
we we definitely hit a plateau as far as its usefulness for people. Maybe it'll be more useful in the future. I don't know. But uh, expecting AI to to magically solve problems because it has more information or something like that um, is probably not going to work. Until you're able to completely control people's uh, fallen sinful natures, you're not really going to be able to fix all of their health. Uh, Keep in mind, like Brian has seen and experienced real poverty, right? He was a Mormon missionary and went to like Central America and got to see people in a really bad state. So I don't think any of the things that he's doing or promoting or telling people or wishing for in the future are like born out of malice. I think he has a humanitarian desire for humanity to get better. The problem is he has an unconstrained vision and history does not support the unconstrained vision. Uh, history repeatedly destroys any unconstrained attempt to to rewrite humanity or to change humanity into something. These are very old ideas. They go way back. They go back to the French Revolution, probably all the way back to ancient Greece, if you wanted to like really look at it in, in fine detail. So that's his religious sentiment. It's a, it's a scientism. He's replaced this idea of science He's replaced God with that idea of science, and now he's looking for the priests of science to tell him what to do, just like how a priest of the Mormon church would tell you about how to act morally. Um, so he's, he's just taking the same approach with that. That's really what motivates it. And once you get that he's a transhumanist, that he believes humans are going to like evolve into something else, right? that we're going to merge and do something else, that we're going to overcome death, uh, you start to realize that's what's motivating him is to change humanity and to erase our nature and those sorts of things. It doesn't mean everything he says is going to be without value, but he's chasing something which will never be caught. And I feel pretty confident in saying that simply because the record shows that you're just not going to catch it. You're just not going to eliminate mortality. It's not going to happen. Um, Instead, what we should think about is living our best life. Try to be as healthy as possible. Maybe that includes improving our diet, lowering our body fat, sleeping more. Those are all things that I could probably do better at, right? Um, Maybe that includes those things, but we're not going to escape death because of that. I prefer live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Live a long life. Live a healthy life. Try to do good in your life, all right? Try to improve your moral situation. If you focus too much on your body and what your body's doing and like, you know, uh, am I injecting the right things in my face to look younger? Am I doing this red light therapy to try to get my hairline to come down a little bit, right? Uh, Focusing on that, you can only do so much. You can only focus on so much stuff. You're not focusing on what you need to focus on when inevitably you will reach that threshold and have to step across the threshold from this life into whatever is beyond that, right? Into the afterlife. So crossing the threshold of death should be on your mind. You should you should think about it, at least from time to time. It doesn't mean that you have to focus on it to the deference of everything else, but if you're focusing so much on your body and your vanity, then you're going to miss... Um, focusing on the virtues that you need in order to prepare for the end of your life as well. So just keep that in mind. It's a religious thing. Once you see it, I think it's really easy to identify in a lot of the things that he did. That being said, I think most of what he has to say is probably pretty valuable or useful. And uh, if you're a thinking person, you can take anything that he has to say with a grain of salt and uh, maybe it makes you think and apply to what you're doing. And that's not a bad thing either, in my opinion. I just... Uh, would caution people not to just embrace it and jump into the blue protocol because uh, you're really jumping into something that's religious. It's like people who are like, I'm going to take up yoga. And I'm like, yoga is actually religious practice. Um, it's not just like stretching. So they take up, they think yoga is like something that's going to improve their health without thinking that it's a religious act, right? Yoga is a religious thing from India. Uh, I, I'm putting that in your mind right now too. And so if people are going to like scratch their heads and be like, wait, wait a minute. I've never really thought about yoga actually being a religious practice, but yes, that's what yoga actually is. So uh, it's an example of that, is that that the blue protocol, if you're going to jump onto it, you might get benefits from it, you know, but you might be doing it for the wrong reasons, right? You might be doing it for uh, the religious reasons that Brian has or be unwittingly starting to buy into what is uh, kind of a pseudo religion is what he's got going on. So anyway... Leave me your thoughts down below. I'd love to read them because I think he's such an interesting guy and I would just love to have more people give their comments on him. I think 
if you're looking at what he's doing, I don't think he looks bad for his age. I think he looks pretty good. Uh, he's got, he's pretty lean, you know. I think his face looks good and skin looks good. So, you know, take that, you could take that for whatever you want it to mean. Um, does he, does it look not good because he doesn't look old? I don't know. Some people have said that. They're like, you know, he should look more mature. Not like someone trying to hold on to his being 30 or something, right? Anyway, give me your thoughts. I'm just interested to, to, to read them and um, make sure you subscribe to my sub stack down below. I'll check you all next time. Have a great, great day. Uh, make sure you join my Patreon. You get a free book every month. This month, as I'm recording it, I believe it is uh, Wasting Desert, a fantasy horror story. So check that out and I will see you all next time.